Please be seated. Last Thursday, many of us gave thanks to the Lord for his wonderful blessings to us. And then we almost ate ourselves to death on turkey and also wonderful treats and of good traditional foods. And afterwards, some of us dozed off watching football, while others hurried off to the malls to catch the best deals of now the before Black Friday sales as shoppers seek to check off all their numerous gift lists. Well, those lucky enough to have family and friends with them spent quality time with one another, catching up and sharing stories. And so begins the season of Advent for most Christians here in America. We barely finish giving thanks to the Lord before we start our preparations for Christmas. One holiday down, another one to go. Yet for Christians who observe Advent, there is a calling from the Lord to actually seek time away from all the busyness demanded by our culture and obligations. Making sure that Johnny gets his new bat and Sally her new catcher's mitt. Notice how politically correct I am there. <laughs> Well, these things may not be quite as important to the Lord as the preparations that we make in our own hearts to prepare us for the celebration of Christ's birth. Preparation through quiet reflection and joyful discovery of who Jesus Christ is are among the gifts that the Lord desires for us to have. See, Advent is God's gift time to us. This is when, if we allow him, he can do his greatest healing as he prepares our hearts to once again, or maybe for the very first time, to receive his son Jesus as our Lord and Savior. In Advent, we physically prepare our homes to celebrate the birth of Jesus while we spiritually seek the Lord's renewal of our hearts as we are reminded of Jesus' second coming. This is a season of duality. We reflect on the past while we prepare for the future and the future that could be just a moment away. In Mark's Gospel for today, we are reminded that the return of Christ is upon us while at the same time unknown to us. As Jesus tells his closest disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, but about that day or hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. While we do not know the day or the hour of our Lord's return, we have been given prophecies to prepare us for the season of Christ's second coming. In the chapter of Mark, the Lord gives several signs hints, if you like, that must be fulfilled before he comes back. The first was fulfilled when the Herod's, Herod's temple that, that he had completed was destroyed. And this happened in 70 AD. False prophets, wars, earthquakes, famines, these will only be the beginning signs of the end. Kind of like birth pains are for the birth of a child. We women can truly relate to that who have actually gone through labor, that first twinging in the womb. Oh, time to go. <laughs> you remember those moments? That's what these things are like. 
And there also, we are told that there will be persecution against the Christians. Even the betrayal by family members will take place. Yet the end is not yet. Many will be martyred for the name of Christ before the Lord returns. Now history has testified to this fulfillment. While today in various nations, Christian blood is being spilled in testimony for the gospel. Sadly, the sword of Islam seeks to kill or at best to suppress the followers of Christ. While Christians continue to be sentenced to slavery and starvation in such desolate places as the death camps in North Korea. The Lord Jesus warns that the times of evil will become so great, so horrible, that unless the Lord God Almighty does not intervene and shorten that time, then all of humanity will be destroyed. Mark writes, For in those days there will be suffering, such as not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now. No, and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he has cut short those days. Does anyone know who the elect are? Those of us who are in Christ. Today, sadly, we are closer to a nuclear war than we have ever been. Under this present administration for the first time in our history, Russia now has more nuclear weapons than the United States. How many knew that? Okay. Yet our current president is not satisfied. His goal is to bring our nuclear arsenal down to only 300, which would be equal to China's current nuclear weaponry. America, which just a few years ago had the strongest navy in the world, has now been cut back to the size it was in 1917. Under the current commander-in-chief, our nation's military has been made the most vulnerable we have ever been in nearly a hundred years. Chilling statistics. Whether we want to admit it or not, America could well be living out her last days on this earth. A nation that sent more missionaries into the world than even the British Empire has now become a sitting duck surrounded by her enemies. Now more than even during the Cuban military crisis of the 1960s, we are closer to being destroyed by nuclear war. Well, this paints a rather bleak picture for those of us in America. We who believe in Jesus Christ, we still have hope. Hope that the Lord God will cut short the days of evil and suffering, that will have dominion over the earth before the return of Christ. Hope that the church will finally repent of her apathy, that a spiritual revival will sweep through this nation, preparing us spiritually to face whatever future remains for America. Hope that the blood of the martyrs that now soaks the ground of the Middle East will bring forth new fruit in Christ that will nourish the nations and arouse the saints Arouse us to return to our first love. The love that first instilled within us that deep longing of a child born so long ago and placed in a manger. 
while we who remain may believe that we have no control or influence over the future, the words of Christ cry out to us over the centuries to keep awake. Whether we are living in the last days, or the beginning of the last days, each one of us is called. We are each one of us called to remain vigilant. We are commanded by our Lord to be ready for his return, no matter what time period in which we are living. So whether we are to be allowed to live out our lives for him or to have our lives cut short for him, the church is to remain as his witness until the end comes. This is our solemn duty and our solemn vow as believers in Christ. Brothers and sisters, our lives are not our own. I know our culture tells us that lie. But it is that our lives are not our own. The media, the celebrities, they all want to make us think that it's all about us, but it's not about us. It's about him. Our lives have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It is through his suffering, through his pain, through his giving, that we have been made his own. In good faith, we cannot ask for our will to be done in our lives. I think of all the selfish prayers that Christians cry out to God for, oh Lord, I really want that new TV for Christmas this year. That's not what God wants. He wants us to have a new heart. He wants for the will of Christ to be done in our lives. So let us awaken from our slumber and choose to work diligently for our Lord while there is still time to do his work in this fallen world. For the day will come when the glory of Christ Jesus will cover the earth like newly fallen snow. Yet the brightness of Christ's glory, unlike snow, will not melt away. His glory will shine on earth as it shines in heaven. It is to this day of renewal that we are to turn our hearts, busying ourselves to bring forth a harvest of souls for the Lord while there is still time. As the sand falls through the hourglass, so does each passing moment bring us ever closer to when we shall see our Master face to face. Be the master of the house when he returns. But those of us who remain, find us awake and ready.